Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a very strong chess player joining us this week. He's an active player as well. He's a top 50 player in the world with a peak rating of 2718. He has won or tied for first in many tournaments, the 2007 European Individual Championships, 2014 Gibraltar Chess Festival, 2009 and 2010 Roy Lopez Masters, just to name a few. And of course, he has just released a book with Thinkers Publishing called Chepadinov's D4. Um, it Unfortunately, it's not on forward chess yet, so I have only seen excerpts of it, but it looks great. And obviously, we've been enjoying uh, talking to various opening authors and get sort of getting sort of um, a big picture view of uh, what's going on with theory and what we're learning from engines and all that stuff. So we're going to dive into that. Uh, but one other thing we should know about our guest, he was also GM Vasilin Topolov's uh, second for seven years. So lot lot to discuss, and I'm excited to have him on the show. So let's go ahead and bring him in. Ivan Chepardinov, how are you, sir? Hi, hello. I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks. And thanks, thanks for joining us. So you're joining us from your native you. Bulgaria. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm in Bulgaria. Yeah, in and, Sofia. And yeah. you mentioned uh, you're headed off to Gibraltar in a few days? Yeah, I go actually in uh, Sunday. Yeah, in okay. two days I go to Gibraltar. Yeah. So, uh, what I I should know this, of course, but w- what event is coming up? Are there? Uh, what is it? The big open tournament coming up? Yeah. Okay. Gibraltar is one of the biggest opens in the world, and many top players are playing there. Uh, also, many USA uh, players, for example, Nakamura is playing all the time, and uh, it's very strong, actually. So. Okay. Yeah. I it's mean, it's one I'm... of the strongest opens in in the world. Okay. Yeah. I'm very very familiar yeah. with it. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't like a separate event, some sort of small. No, no. Under... It's this one. It's this one. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So so how does I'm? Um, it's nice of you to take a break from. I'm sure what is a lot of prepar- preparation and you've got a family as well but as a as a tournament of that magnitude gets closer uh wh- what sort of work do you do uh, yeah okay lately for me it's very difficult to to concentrate on my play and to train like i do i did it before because many years ago i was uh, mostly just uh, preparing for my tournaments and uh, i was doing a lot of fitness uh, gym and a lot of stuff but nowadays it's a bit more difficult because i have small daughter and it's, uh, okay, you know, everybody who has a kid, uh, you know, that it's not very easy now to, to do all this stuff. But still, I'm trying to, to train and to do my best as a player. Yeah. Mostly as a player, yeah. Yeah, I and a lot of people listening can can relate to the how your professional priorities change when you have kids, even if we can't relate to being a 2700. Um, yeah, okay, everything changes. I mean, life changes, So, but it's for good, so it's not so... But <laughs> yeah, and does that make the travel more challenging? Does it make it harder to be away uh, from home? Okay, for the moment, um, because my wife is also she's a world champion, uh, Antoinette Stefanova, and she also is traveling a lot. So we are traveling mostly together. So, uh, but okay, we have my mother, which uh, she's helping us a lot. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's... I mean, it's not easy. Of course, it's not easy. But okay, for the moment, our daughter is still young, so. Okay, we have uh, no travel to to travel, but after some time, it will be even more difficult. So yeah, that makes sense. And how does your little girl like life on the road? Does she like traveling? Uh, okay, for the moment, she's just only one year old. So ah, okay. She travel yet? But uh, I bet she'll I mean, like after it though. Some years for sure she will be. So. Yeah, my kids love hotels. We don't we don't travel very much, but when we yeah. do, they're always excited. Um, but mm-hmm. let's let's get to your book, Ivan. Um, I you so you mentioned in the intro that you actually. So this is amazing. You hadn't read an opening book in 10 years. And now... Oh, even more, even more, yeah. Wow, I, even I more. I just put 10 years because I didn't want it to be, you know. <laughs> I, I maybe, okay, maybe I, when I was a kid, I was uh, studying all kinds of books. I mean, especially I liked books for uh, middle games, end games, and books for, uh, for example, of some of the top players of the time, let's say like Botvinnik, you know, all these books. I liked very much. But lately, yeah, the last last years I didn't read the opening book. Yeah, it's amazing because I even didn't do it on purpose. I just didn't uh, wanted to be um, how to say 
uh, because everybody is do is making something in this book that I I want to have my own opinion, you know, of yeah. the thing. So that's why I wanted just to skip all this this stuff. But now I understand that maybe okay, maybe I could do it. I could uh, probably read some nice books because there are some good books that uh, definitely you need to to have it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, it's not like you weren't using a database, which which at your level. Well, of course, I was using database all the time, of course. Yeah. So so you dig in to write this book. And once you do decide to write it, did you did you look around at any other ones just so you sort of, of course, felt like you knew what no, to do? When I decided to write, I was reading, oh, for example, I liked very much the books of uh, Boris Avruch. Somehow uh, I had a feeling that you would go there first. His books are so legendary. Yeah, no, no, I really like them because before I didn't uh, check them, of course, <laughs> but now I really wanted to see how they're writing the books and what is the strategy to make the book because I really didn't have an idea how to do it. And uh, especially of his books, I really learned a lot. Yeah, I think uh, this probably for me, this was one of the best books of the time. Yeah. Okay. Or and, opening books, I mean. Yeah. yeah, and we should say that this is going to be a multi-volume project, and volume one is about which lines, Ivan? Yeah, uh, volume one, it's about uh, against Grunfeld and King's Indian, and uh, third move, F3. So after D D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, F3. So basically, it's uh, covering Zemish against King's Indian and uh, F3 against Grunfeld, yeah. Yeah, fun fighting chess for sure. Yeah, yeah it's very fighting and a very principal line that uh, many top players are playing for both colors. So it's uh, very exciting. Yeah. This is only the first bomb. There will be much more. So. Yeah, I bet. D4, yeah. that's, a, that's a big topic. So, so yeah, what... D4, there are many, many openings. Yeah, yeah. So what surprised you in digging into your research? Was there, was there a line that, that, was there like a particular line that was doing way, way better or way worse than you thought? Or was there some sort of like tactical rabbit hole that, that you ended up going down um, when you found some crazy computer line? Anything like that? Yeah, no, uh, for me, the idea to write the book was uh, very interesting because I wanted, I know that mostly the chess books, for opening, uh, the people are writing for people, let's say, 2,000 or 2,100, no? something like this. And my goal was to be a bit more, um, even for some strong players, you know, like 2,500 maybe, even 2,600. And that's why I was wondering how to do it, because uh, it's not very easy. I mean, you need to really to know what you want to write and uh, which op which lines you want to include and uh, how you want to do it for amateurs or for both you know because it's not very easy so this was the most challenging for me uh, how to do it exactly and i think uh, finally i decided to simply to make it uh, how i feel that should be and just to see if uh, the people will like it because i i cannot skip for myself you know i mean yeah i really because i was working with many top players with vessel into power many others and for me, chess is um, not only sport, but it's also kind of science. So for me, for example, if I find some, let's say I'm, try, I'm writing the book for white, but if I find something interesting for black, I want to also want to put it in the book, you know, because uh, for me, it's not um, very good if you just skip some lines just to make the book looking very good, you know. So that's why I wanted to make it for both colors, kind of. Okay, especially for white, but also many interesting ideas uh, for black. Because, okay, we know that chess is, uh, I mean, we cannot just kill chess with some opening, you know. It's yeah, yeah. very difficult. I mean, okay, maybe some people, they think that, uh, okay, you play F3 and you win all the games. I mean, it's not <laughs> working like this, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you really need to be prepared for both colors. And that's why I wanted to, even in my intro, I put it that I... Uh, my structure of the book is that uh, I'm giving all the lines for white, of course, but there are some interesting ideas for black. So if you play Grunfeld or King's Indian with black, there are also very interesting ideas for black. So Excellent. Yeah. And, Sorry. I was, and I was just going just gonna to add, there's a free excerpt on the Thinkers Publishing website for anyone who wants to check it out. That's what, that's what I was able to check out. But sorry, continue what you were saying. Uh, no, okay. Mainly this was that uh, simply... Uh, for me, the most challenging was this the structure of the book, how I want to do it and what I want to put there. and uh, Because I wanted that the people uh, understand what is my understanding of chess and how I 
look at the openings and how I look at chess in general, you know. So what would so, you say about that? What could you, just to give us a little teaser, how would you just, what is your general chess philosophy? Yeah, okay, mainly because, okay, I think this was developed very much when I was working with Veselin because uh, at that point, okay, I was already a very strong grandmaster, but of course I was only 18 years old or 17, so I I learned a lot from him and with the work with him. So mostly for me, in the openings, especially when you're preparing some opening, I'm not uh, looking only the computer moves, you know, like many of the people of these days they're doing, just looking the evaluation and, you know. And uh, what I'm doing, I'm trying to also understand the positions and maybe sometimes to give uh, not the best moves for, I mean, objectively, maybe they're not the best moves, but in practice they're really causing more problems, you know, mm -hmm. because objectively speaking, chess is a draw, right? right? So if everybody plays with computer, probably to make a draw, you know, in every line, mo most probably, no. Mm -hmm. So my goal was to, to show in this book that um, there are some lines that they're very difficult to play, uh, for example, to play with black, yeah, that there's some interesting op uh, opening lines that if you uh, see it for first time, it's very difficult to, to play over the board. So this is the point of all, all the book, I, I guess. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. And and by the uh, way, I did want to follow up. You mentioned that, that this book can be read by players up to 25, 2600 level. Um, of course, we also, we have listeners of, of all chess experience levels. We have grandmasters listening and people basically brand new to the world of chess. Um, are, do you think that for people even rated below 2000, would they be able to benefit from, from this book? Uh, I really think yes, I really think yes, because um, what I said that I really tried to do it for uh, for everybody, so I, I guess they will find very interesting things also, yes. But it's mostly, I guess, for people 2,000 or 2,100 probably is the best, but also every every rating, every range, because it's... Uh, it's in general, it's very good, I think. Okay, I so probably I'm guessing the analysis would be good of obviously the analysis, if you're trying to make it um, valid for the, the strongest players in the world, then it's valid for the youngest yeah, players. Yeah, but of course, also I put a lot of explanations, a oh, lot good. Of, okay. of basic explanations. I mean, it's a uh, very strong players. They will, of course, understand that it's uh, written for uh, uh, most um, mostly for 2100 or something, but... Uh, also, they'll find the moves very interesting, you know, and the people who are 20, 2100 or 2000, they'll understand because I really put a lot of explanations and how the positions should play, be played and uh, so on. So I, I guess for everybody it will be interesting because I already have friends who, who check the book, they're grandmasters and they really like it. So I guess it will be for all people simply. Yeah, I that, guess. That's this, good. Is, this was my hope. This is my hope. Yeah, yeah. Everybody will like it. So Excellent. That's good news. And with a tournament like Gibraltar coming up, do I dare ask, um, like I was talking to GM Jan Gustafsson recently who had just published a, cor published a course on uh, Double King Pawn for Chessable. Mm -hmm. And he was saying like a couple days later when the course has just come out it's kind of difficult to pull the trigger actually playing the opening because you're worried someone like you know uh just went to your book found something and is lay like laying in the weeds waiting do you do you have that feeling with with gibraltar will, will you uh venture these lines if you get a chance no but i i'm uh, playing everything in chess so for me it's not real i mean i play all the openings i play e4 d4 c4 so all the moves so i mean for me i mean there's some interesting ideas of course that maybe if i if I skip them, probably I could win some games, you know. But, I mean, the goal of this book is not like this. So the goal of this book is to be uh, well-received from the people. And uh, my idea was just to try to help uh, the, the players who want to to play this opening. So this is my vision of, the, of chess. And uh, I just wanted to give it everything. I didn't really think about skipping some lines or, you know, catching somebody or something like this. So, the, Yeah, me, that makes sense. Yeah. And of course... Because you, many people I know, okay, I, I know it's maybe not good to say, but I mean, I read... That's why probably I didn't like a lot of opening books because sometimes, years ago, I remember that some people, they were even uh, uh, very, you know, they liked the idea that they skip some lines and then maybe later they can, you know, they can catch someone right, or right. something like this. But uh, for me, this is not the, the goal of the book, so...
That's good to hear. Yeah. And of yeah. course, you, you've you uh, being a, a top 50 player, you've played so many just uh, household chess names, Ding Loren, Anand, Ivan Chuk. Yeah, Lizzie, many, so. many, many. Yeah. Yeah. More. So when you're preparing for someone like that, you mentioned that you do have a wide repertoire. You play a lot of stuff. So how how do you decide what to play against a given opponent? Okay, it uh, depends on uh, many things. Depends on situation, tournament situation. Depends on uh, how I'm feeling this day. And depends um, in general in the tournament how it's going. Because sometimes, you know, you're in very good shape. Then you have more go- confidence. Then you can play very sharp sharp lines because you are very, you know, very confident. And sometimes you don't feel very good or you don't sleep very well or something like this. So you decide to play more safely. So it depends on um, on the open on the opponent and also how you're feeling. So I can that's why it's very good to have um, a lot wide uh, opening repertoire because you can uh, change. You know, you can change your style sometimes. You can uh, just add some things. And if you don't have this, if you don't play everything, then it's very difficult because if you play only one opening or two openings, you cannot. Uh, switch you know it's very difficult so yeah. because yeah. in general everybody is very well prepared and if you just try to play something just to escape it's it's a bad idea usually so <laughs> yeah although there are people at, at your level who manage to pull it off right there are certainly players like i'm thinking of like gawain jones and basa mamin who i interviewed that that are known to have like more narrow repertoires Yes, yes, but they they have different strategy. They they know them very well. They know these openings very well, and sometimes they even, uh, for example, Amin, because I know him very well. I played many times with him, and he he plays only Kings Indian, and sometimes he has problem in the openings, but he understands very well the position. So sometimes he just doesn't mind to be a bit worse after the opening, but then he he plays very well. So. I mean, this is different strategy, but simply I'm different type of uh, player. So there, there are many different types, and I just try to to switch because I really, how to say, uh, what I said before is that I only see chess as science, so not only as uh, sport. So sometimes I just want to switch because to be more interesting for me, you know, just to to try different things. So it's. Uh, for me, it's question also of this that I sometimes want to try some different openings, some tri- different ideas, maybe just to see how it's going on. So yeah, that makes sense. And, and also, I'm working a lot on openings, and I'm working a lot on chase in general. Okay, before I was working better, but still I'm working. So I mean, I I have very good memory, so uh, I ha- I don't see point to to play only one opening for me. I mean, for some other people, maybe it's different, but for me. I just want to try different things because I I'm able to do it. So why why not? I mean. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, having a good memory has got to be super helpful. Yeah. No, when this it comes is like in tennis. Let's say I mean Roger Federer. I mean he's playing all kinds of shots, you know, because he can, you know, not because he 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 can play only one shot, but he likes everything because he's very good. No, so yeah. If you are good in some things, you can. For example, in openings, I'm very good. I believe so. That's why I can, you know, I can switch and I can play diff- different things so yeah that makes sense and certainly having worked on a world championship team speaks speaks to the the reputation you must have for for uh wide opening knowledge yeah okay in uh, the matches with uh, Veselin, i mean i learned a lot and uh, all these matches that we were together i mean we, we were working like crazy so <laughs> yeah i want to i want to come back to that but i have one one more question related mm-hmm. to to your book Chaparinov's d4 uh this one is from a supporter of the podcast uh his um so basically the way it works is if um it, i've sent a i have an email list for people who've who've donated to support perpetual chess and when i tell them what the guests in a little bit about their bio so uh j deep chakrabarty uh wrote in sorry if i said your last name wrong j deep um wrote in to ask, um, he says, I play 1d4 as white always, and I've seen in tournaments um, an uncommon opening against lower-rated players can make it easier to win. For example, he plays the modern against e4, even though he's a Sicilian player, to catch people off guard. Is there an uncommon opening against d4 that you could suggest for lower-rated players, is his question. Well, it's a difficult question for me, but uh, Okay, probably I will say something like uh, Benoni or Volga, uh, Benko Gambit, which it's, uh, okay, it's very popular, of course, but, uh, I mean, these are the openings that with black you can really make a point. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you are, 
better player, I mean, you can make a points. Because they're very risky openings, Benoni or Benko Gambit, but, uh, but okay, there are many interesting positional ideas in this opening, so if you're a better player, probably it's very interesting. I mean, when I was a kid, I was playing all the time all these openings, so Kings oh, cool. Indian also. Okay, Kings Indian is always a weapon, so Kings Indian is always very interesting. So And not, now what are your preferred openings? I should know this, but what what do you... Uh, now it's okay. For me, I, for Black, I'm playing also everything, but uh, most uh, recently I'm playing Grunfeld and... Uh, and some kind of knight of 66, so this kind of Queen's Gambit and this stuff. Okay. Need to be need to Indian and this stuff, yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, and do you know yet, um, Ivan, which, what volume two will be? Obviously, it's going to be a big project, so do you know what you'll tackle next? Yeah, I think next it will be all this Slav uh, stuff. Okay, with, yeah. Uh, starting with D5, C4, C6. And uh, maybe some something else will be added, no, but pro- most probably uh, Luffy will be the main uh, main stuff, yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, listeners, especially if you're a D4 or um, a Grunfeld or King's Indian player, sounds like the book is worth checking out. Um, but yeah, I'm y- planning to cover everything after D4, so wow. I, I'll cover all the openings. Yeah, pr- B- so. Big project. How many years do you think this, this will take? No, I think... Uh, in two years, I think it will be, because it will be like four volumes, so I think in two years we will probably finish. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, and of course, now that you're home more with your daughter, that gives you something to work on. So I'm already working on the second volume, actually, but okay, yeah. I want it to be a surprise, but uh, okay, I'm already working. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I'd like to circle back to uh, the Team Tapalov stuff, but let's first we're going to take a quick break. Later in this interview, you're going to hear Super GM Cheparinov talk about how he started blindfold chess training when he was four years old. Us adult chess players can't do that, but we can still work on our visualization. Chessable has some courses specifically designed for that called the Visualize series. Its primary aim is to train visualization, not tactics or calculation. The difference is that you're not looking for a tactic from a specific position, but having to visualize a position one to seven moves ahead, hold the position in your head, and then find the tactic from there. The visualized courses are a great tool for anyone rated below 2000. Go to chessable.com to check them out or check the show notes to find the link. All right, back to the interview. So, Ivan, according to the internet, you know, unreliable source that it is, you worked with uh, GM Vasilin Tapala for seven years. Is that about right? Uh, okay, I need to count, but they're very, uh, a lot of years. Yeah, From 2005 to 2011, yes. Okay, and you so mentioned seven, that you were you were quite a young man when you started working with him. I was um, seventeen, I guess. Yeah, I was seventeen. So, did he pick you, being that you're from Bulgaria, or how did the relationship begin? No, the relation is uh, more complicated because uh, his manager Silvio Danayov was my manager when I was thirteen years old. So, uh, basically, we had one manager, and I was playing a lot of tournaments in Spain. And okay, you know that he's living in Spain, so they both are living in Spain. And uh, at some point, simply because I was already grandmaster with 2620 or something, and I was like 17 years old, and okay, also I'm from Bulgaria, of course, and we, okay, simply our manager, he decided that probably it's a good idea just to try to work with Veselin, and I, um, okay, once I just went uh, to his apartment in Salamanca, so uh, just to, to see how it will go. And uh, it was me and another very strong player, but wow. I will not say his name because maybe it's not a good idea, I don't know. And we were together and then simply he decided that probably it's, um, it's very good because I was good in openings and, uh, okay, we had very good, good uh, chemistry, chemistry with him. I mean, we really became friends. So sometimes, I mean, they just decided that probably it's a good idea to try. And then everything started from this. So I went with them in Linares, the first uh, Linares, when he beat Kasparov in the last game, when Kasparov retired, actually. So this was my first uh, time with uh, with Veselin. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, he's, again, he's a household name in the chess world, but I, I can only imagine in Bulgaria, he must be an absolute legend. So what no, did he's it... he's a rock star. He's a yeah. rock star. <laughs> yeah, so... Everybody knows him, of course. Yeah. yeah, so what did it feel like to have that opportunity as such a young man? No, but at that point, um, it's funny, because at that point, I didn't think about this, because, I mean, I was very close with uh, our manager, so... 
and I knew Veselin for many years, and I mean, okay, for me he was very strong player, but not, I mean, not something like uh, a, a god or something, you know. I mean, he was just normal person that, okay, he was very strong in chess. So, <laughs> I mean, we were friends and um, for me it was nothing uh, so big. I mean, we were just working on chess and I wanted to concentrate on my career, of course, uh, and I was just uh, doing this, uh, like, opportunity to work with the best player and then to try to add something in my own chess career. So... I mean, for me, it was not a big special thing. I don't know, but of course, for a- anybody, because in Bulgaria it was uh, he was very big, and especially 2005, he won almost all the tournaments, and he became world champion, and I mean, he did everything, so he became even more popular. So yeah. Yeah, and I'm looking. It looks like uh, the the Tapalov Kasparov game you mentioned in Lenars was yeah. in two, in 2005. It, it was his last game. It was Kasparov's last game. Yeah. So what did what? To, were you so you were there on the scene for that tournament? You were. In... I was there because I, rem- I remember that I was playing uh, uh, this Linares uh, Open, and after it finished, uh, they still needed to play like five rounds or I don't know something like this. And then uh, Silvio, his manager, told me, "Okay, maybe you can uh, stay with us just to see how it goes." And so I stayed, and uh, everything started from there. So after that, okay, everything you know, all all the history we make. So yeah. And this was the first. Uh, just they just want to try with me if it will work, and okay, it appeared that it worked very good. So yeah. So I'm look. So was were you involved in? It looks like this was a a Sicilian sort of sideline, the Topalov Kasparov game. Were you involved in the prep for that game? No, and that I was very little. In fact, because they had already this idea to play, and I just checked their files, their lines, but. Uh, this this was just the first time, so I didn't really do anything about this game. No. It's, okay. And I but don't... after that, everything you know, all very interesting ideas. Mostly they were mine. Yeah, mostly. Wow, that that's that's pretty impressive. Especially maybe you know this uh, Kramnik, very famous game with Kramnik in Vikanze, uh, when he played this twelve move knight takes f seven. He sacrificed knight in Moscow uh, gambit. And uh, from 2008, I think. Uh, and okay. This was very famous novelty that, um, okay, it was just a uh, very interesting novelty. So just sacrifice a piece for a pawn. And um, I think this was the highlight because this was really very important novelty. And even nowadays, they're still playing it. So it's, wow. uh, yeah. yeah, and this was 2008 with much... Uh, uh, weaker computers, of course, and uh, I mean, it was very, very difficult to do it. It was, it was just very difficult. And... So, but you'd done a lot of work on it, and uh, so yeah, how yeah. how nervous were you when when Knight takes F7 got played over the board in the Kramnik no, game? No, actually, okay, we have a very funny story about this game because uh, we prepared this for uh, I don't know, maybe two years before that. I remember it was some Vikings that I was playing, so I was playing against. Uh, Dutch uh, player uh, Jan Smith, and he was playing all the time this opening. So I, before the game, I prepared this. I just found this idea, and I prepared. And I remember that we were speaking before going to the round, and I told Veselin, okay, I have this idea. Maybe it's interesting. I don't know. I'll just try it. And uh, then, but he played different openings, so this didn't appear. So after that, we decided to prepare very well against the match with Kramnik in 2006. And uh, but he still Kramnik didn't play this opening, so still we didn't uh, have it. Then we had some other opportunities to play, but nobody entered in this line for some reason. So for two years we just uh, you know we were just in standby. This line was yeah. there, but nobody played against us because we had many opportunities to play it, but I mean nobody entered exactly in this opening. So it was very strange. Because this was one of the main openings at the time. So, I mean, it was very strange. But somehow, Kramnik decided to play it exactly at this moment. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so actually, finally, Veselin played. Because it was very po- uh, possible that maybe I would play it against someone, you know. Yeah. Not famous. But somehow, I mean, the destiny was that Kramnik needed to play it. Uh, and, I mean, it was... That, that's it's a, like this, yeah. That's so, an amazing story. Thank you for being yeah. so so open about yeah, it. Yeah, two years we had this line. We wow. were preparing for matches and matches, and you know, and finally, okay, finally. And would you ever working with a player of that stature? Would you ever feel like you needed to hold something back in your own games? Uh, no, no, because uh, I mean, with Veselin uh, and with everybody I'm working, I mean, 
mostly we are working together. It's not like um, he's my boss and, you know, I'm just uh, trying to deliver some lines, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is the only thing that I always that I'm working with some strong players. Before that, I'm just say, t- telling them that uh, I also want to improve. So if we want, we can work together and it's like both sides, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not like uh, I just give my lines and, uh, you know. So that's why I, I can play everything. So, for example, when we worked with Vesselin, I could play all the ideas. I mean, there's no, I didn't have doubt about this. So, yeah, uh, this is very important because I know some players that they, for example, some top players, they decided, okay, they uh, buy some analysis, but they say, okay, you will not play it never, you know. So, okay, some people, they agree for that. Of course, it's not so bad, but I mean, for me, it's not, it's never like this. So. That's good. Yeah. And you were, you know, I mean, you still are, you're only, you're only 33, but even younger then and, you know, climbing yeah, the, climbing the ladder. I'm still playing professionally. I mean, okay, I'm not a top player, but still I'm trying to, to do my best. So I'm still. Yeah, of course. No, there. I mean, I, it's, it's amazing. Like, I, I feel like guys who aren't in the, the top 20 don't get the credit they do for their due for just how incredible and how much work you guys have all put in put into chess um so i by no means do i mean to short sell everything that, that you've accomplished um yeah. but moving it forward with um with uh team Tapalov, um one thing i'm curious about is in the past few months really a lot of information has come to light that maybe to people like you was already known but to the broader chess audience really wasn't um with the anon files coming out and with mind master by vishy anand and anon files of course by recent guest of the show mikhail oblin um are you are you familiar with either of those books yeah actually yeah, i've been a bit ashamed that i didn't read this book yet but uh, somebody told me okay one very good friend of mine told me it's a very nice book <laughs> of this anon files and and, uh, yeah, I need to read it. I don't know, but I know some things in the book, and uh, it seems very interesting. So yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, yeah, it seems very. But actually, it seems very similar to to many things that happened with Veselin during our matches. Because uh, okay, I cannot reveal some things because I mean I never say it, so it's uh, maybe some other time. But I mean, there's some things in the this book of uh, Vichy that. Uh, we had similar stuff with Vesely. So, interesting. I mean, it's very interesting. No, because some guy that, okay, Erwin Lamy from uh, yeah. Poland, he, because we worked together in this match with Anand, and he told me some things that they're unbelievably the same, very similar to what happened with Vesely. I mean, very, very similar. So probably I was thinking that maybe all these top players, they have uh, some things in common, you know, they have some things so- that... I mean, yeah. So are these like the interpersonal dynamics, like people, how they get along with each other? Or did it have to do with like the actual prep? What, I mean, I know that there's only so much you're comfortable saying, but but what do you mean by there were similar things? No, there were similar things in their behavior, I guess, in how they, um, how, for example, you are working for them and then sometimes you don't, you know, you skip some stuff just to be that they are very com- comfortable with this with the opening, you know. For example, Veselin, he liked very much to be very confident before the game, you know. Mm-hmm. He liked to be very confident. And sometimes, okay, you know, in the last moment, for example, you had some uh, strange idea for the opponent, maybe not so stupid, but okay, sometimes it's better just not to tell him that it's very interesting, that, you know, sometimes just better to tell him, okay, some move, but it's not it's nothing dangerous, you know. And then he feels better because he goes with confidence, you know. Things like this. That I mean, people they they're different people. Simply, I don't know. For example, for me, it's different. For me, I know to I really want to know all the information and then to make decisions, you know. But some people they need to be confident before the game, so they really right. need to to think that everything is covered and you know, like you're winning everywhere. So you know, you just go and <laughs> yeah, and so, not uh, yeah. And what I'm, I understood that the, in this book there are some similar things, but I need to read read because I didn't read the book yet. So yeah, I think you'd enjoy it. Um, and oh, Mikhail, yeah. Mikhail Ablin, uh, writer of the Anon Files, I, I we've become friendly since uh, since I interviewed him, and he um, when I told him that I was interviewing you, he mentioned that I could possibly ask you um, if you have any regrets that Vasilin didn't play e4 in the Sofia match because it's now huh. it's now known that Anon would have played the French. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, okay, we had no idea, of course. Yeah. But, uh, no, of course we don't have regrets because I think generally with White he was uh, pressing all the games, especially the last one. 
But the, all the other games, I mean, he was really pressing. So I think we were very good prepared. The only thing that I regret is this last game because he... I mean, okay, this I will say it because this is very interesting. Probably everybody will enjoy it. <laughs> and I don't think it's something very bad. I mean, last game, uh, everybody knows that Vesely, he suicide himself. He just uh, didn't want to make a draw and he lost this game. Yeah. And if he would make a draw, it would be a tie break and nobody knows what will happen. But the point is that uh, maybe you all remember that uh, before this match, actually the match started like three days after the normal schedule because of uh, this volcano in Iceland. I don't know if you remember, but yeah, there was yeah. some volcano that all the flights, they were cancelled for mounts or something. So it was big disaster in Europe. So uh, uh, Anand, he needed to come in Bulgaria, for, I think from Germany or something like this. He needed to come like three days before or something, but then because of this volcano, they were stuck in Germany. And okay, the match basically started like three days after that, after the normal schedule. So uh, the tie break uh, normally should be, let's say, like 10th of September, but uh, now it's like 13th, you know. And uh, Vesely, he was very pissed about this because, okay, before he didn't know, but after, okay, the last game, before the last game, he, he understood that it will be exactly the same date that he lost the tie break with Kramnik. So uh, <laughs> exactly the same so. date. That's funny. And he started to be crazy and he said like, no, I need to win this game, otherwise the tiebreak will be exactly the same date and okay, I will lose and so on. And okay, we, we were not able to stop him because, I mean, he, okay, his manager probably need to do something, but he couldn't uh, save him and uh, finally, okay, we saw what happened. I mean, he just, in very equal position, he just went with some King H3 and he suicide himself, so... He lost this game. I mean, this is only a regret because I believe in some tiebreak uh, he had still chances. I mean, okay, of course, Anand was very strong, rapid player, but I mean, yeah. in some tiebreak you you don't know what. Yeah, and so was so was Vasilin, of course. So no, I truly believe he could probably win this match, but I mean, this game, I mean, he was just uh, crazy. So <laughs> this okay. was the, the only regret I have because the match generally was very good. With white, he was pressing. Okay, with black, he has some problems. And I believe he needed to switch the opening, but uh, simply he didn't want it. So, I mean, it's very difficult to... With him, it was very difficult to discuss some things. You know, when he wanted to do something, it was very difficult to, <laughs> right. to do something. So, I mean, because he was losing this Catalan all the time with black. And, I mean, he needed probably to change. But, okay, it's uh, already in the past. So, yeah. we never know what would happen. If he changed, probably he would lose again. So, I mean, we don't know. Yeah. Well, a, a few, first of all, for listeners that we should be clear, this is the 2010 world championship match between Anand and Tapalov in, in, in Sofia. Um, and the other thing I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit because both Anand in Mindmaster and Mikhail Oblin in the Anand files wrote about the fact that Anand at the last second, as you alluded to, needed to drive, uh, the whole way to Bulgaria. Um, and as you mentioned, um, uh, this kind of, um, this delayed the start of the match, and there seemed to be some some sort of ill will as residue from that. Um, no, like, but actually, probably this won the match for him because really, Veselin was very pissed that this was uh, exactly this the same date, you know, the tiebreak. So, I mean, this really was very big point of winning the match. <laughs> I mean, it was really good this uh, that they delayed the match for Anand, I guess, because yeah. he started to to have these thoughts. And to us, he started to have these thoughts. It was very difficult, you know, to because he was not thinking about the game, about the, right. You know, yeah, that can be distracting. Uh, and he was really, he was really, really pissed. I mean, I remember that. He do was you just, do you think? I mean, I don't know how much you want to speak for Vasilin or if you feel comfortable answering this, but do you, do you feel like it was reasonable to be upset? I mean, the, it seems like. Uh, to team and on like that's it's not entirely within their control when there's a volcano in Iceland and they they have trouble getting of course, there. No, of course I, I believe it was just a coincidence, you know, that this happened. But I mean, for him, because I know him very well, and he was this type of person that uh, I mean, sometimes he started to think something is very difficult to to take off from his head, you know. I mean, just it was impossible. So for him, I believe really for him it was uh, the the turning point because before that this was very good. And before the last game, he understood because before he didn't pay attention. But exactly before the the last game, he understood that the tiebreak will be this day, and he started to be. I mean, he started to be not. 
I mean, not himself already. I mean, he started to be uh, to be different person, and you know, just not don't think about the game. And yeah, I mean, I truly believe that this lost his match. Truly believe. Wow, man, amazing to get. I mean, that okay, teacher. it's not the fault of Anand or his team, of course. I mean, it's just coincidence of you know, I mean, this could happen, but simply. And he was not pissed of an aunt or something. He was pissed mostly that simply the destiny, you know, just turned it to be exactly this day, you know. Because yeah. it could be 14th, it could be 12th, you know. But exactly this day, you know. <laughs> I mean, well, do you, what do you think the, the refusing to shake hands thing is about? Like uh, Anand writes, there was one game where there was a draw, but they decided to go through the, the Arbiter mutually because they didn't want to shake hands because... To be honest, I don't, rem- I don't okay. remember this stuff. I remember only... Uh, with Kramnik, they had problems, but with Vichy, I really don't remember they had... Uh, okay. Prob- probably they were just tense, because the match was very tense, and probably they were very serious and very tense, all of them. Also, Vichy, I believe, I mean, he was playing in Sofia, and okay, of course, he could think some kind of things, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, he talks about promo, that. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine, because I was in uh, Russia with Vesel when we played against uh, Vladimir Kramnik, so... Um, I remember what it was there. So okay, I can imagine that he has some had something in his mind, you know, and everybody was very tense, I guess. Yeah. So also for... from Vichy, I heard that he said to some interview that this was his uh, most intense match in his career, you know, I mean even more than with Kasparov and all these matches. So probably it was very tense for, for him also. So Yeah. And so for listeners who aren't clear that um Ivan is just saying that because it was in the other player's home turf, you worry about some sort of subterfuge with people either learning you're learning your lines or stuff like that. Like Anand tells a story in Mindmaster about they they have basically a security person on their team, and he didn't they didn't even tell Anand that it was a security person. But at the end, but he was always like checking the curtains for bugs and stuff like that. And Anand, Anand only found out later that that was the guy's actual role on the team. So yeah, it's cra- crazy the level that. That uh, these, I mean, understandable, especially given the history, the Soviet stories from back in the day. But, no, but still crazy after to read. The match with Kramnik because okay, everybody knows so what happened in this match, and after that, I mean, everybody was already thinking in Sofia what could be, you know. I mean, okay, of course, I knew we knew that in Sofia nothing is possible, nothing can can be done because okay, here is. It's, I mean, it's not Soviet uh, Union, so it's different. But still, I mean, when you go to some other player's country, I mean, you can think that something can happen. I mean, it's it's normal. I mean, yeah, it's not, not crazy to think. Of course. Yeah, okay, one more on this match, if you don't mind. Um, so, uh, there, in, in these books, the other thing that has come out is that, that Team Topalov had access to sort of a, a supercomputer that was ahead of its time. <laughs> very funny. It yeah, very funny. The, the Ripka 4. So, uh, were, you, were, you the man, were you the man behind the curtain with Ripka 4? <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course. No, but this is funny because, uh, okay, I'll say this. I mean, I just hope uh, my previous manager, Silvio Danilo, will not be not mind. But, I mean, this is true. Uh, because they they were claiming that uh, also we had some supercomputer from Bulgarian government and I don't know how many cores and it was like big deal. And actually this computer existed. They just, uh, from Bulgaria, they at that time they bought this computer for I don't know many, how many millions. And uh, mostly this is for the weather or something like this, you know, this computer. And they tried, really tried to work on, um, with chess programs and chess engines, but it was not possible. <laughs> I mean, actually, it was not possible. So, uh, Silvio, he just said everywhere that we use this supercomputer and stuff just to scare an aunt. Oh, know? okay. That's amazing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but of course, we had Ripka. We had Ripka. I don't remember if it was four or something, but it was some kind of special Ripka. But we had in some normal computers, I mean, some at the time very good computers, but not something special. Because this supercomputer, it was like million cores or something like this, I don't know, a thousand cores. And this was very good computer, but they couldn't make it <laughs> because they really tried, but they couldn't make it because we had only one mount and all these IT specialists, they couldn't make it. So finally, he decided just to say that uh, we are using it, but okay, finally, we, we didn't use it. So It sounds like it worked. I mean, Anand spends a lot of time talking about oh, it in Mindmaster. No, that... we had very good computers, very good at the time. 
probably the best, but not uh, not this one. I mean, not super super computer. You know, yeah. no, no. But not I also like Alpha Zero or something. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and I also meant that the, the psychology worked. The the fact that the psychology that's... was brutal. I mean, it was yeah. Really big. I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for being so open. That's that's just an incredible. No, but this is in the past already, so I don't. I guess there will be no no problem. So <laughs> yeah, and are are you still working with Zapalov at all? Uh, no, from many years not from 2011. I don't work with them. And um, okay, with Veselin, I still guess we're in good conditions. But uh, with his manager, we're not in very good relations. So uh, I'm not working with them. But okay, I always uh, follow his games, his tournaments. So I mean, I wish him all, all the time very good, all the yeah. best. And what about well, uh... he's been friend forever? I mean, I really liked him, and the the time we spent together, it was just. Very good. Yeah. And what about uh, Romain Edward, of course, uh, of Thinkers Publishing, who put us in touch? Um, so, how was he involved? I mean, I know he's written a book about this, but um, like, uh, what were your interactions with him? Yeah, actually, he he stole my book because, <laughs> because <laughs> I mean, I could really, I mean, I still can write a book about this because I have so many stories. But it will be probably if I decide to write, it will be not about chess. It will be about the matches and uh, the time spent with him because, I mean, I know so many things that I mean, so oh, wow. many stories. Uh, and maybe one day I will do it. That would be but great. But yeah, okay, he stole the book because, okay, I, I worked with Wesley in like seven years and he worked, I guess, three, four years. But the book is very good. I read the book. It's very nice. And actually, maybe he's one of the main reasons I started to, to, to write these books because these volumes. Because he he was in touch with me and uh, with Daniel also, and we were in touch, and they somehow convinced me to do it. Because from the beginning, I was not really sure that I want to do it, and also ve- he was very helpful with uh, the process of the book and helping me with questions and everything. So I really want to help him because without him, I could couldn't do it like this. You know. Yeah. So. Well, they're doing great work. I mean, it seems well, they're doing it because uh, the book was very good but when they you know um, saw the book and tried to add some things i mean they they did it very good i mean they really changed uh, many things so i mean i'm very help- uh, thankful f- uh, for their work I mean. yes and, and as we are um so finishing up ivan i know that, that you've got a lot going on let's just uh let's just hear a little bit more about well there's a couple things actually um one i just wanted to talk a little bit more about your chess so um what are your what so you don't have as much time as you used to to work on your chess, but when you do, is it mostly opening work, or are you able to work on other aspects of your game still at your level as well? Uh, yeah, of course, it's mostly opening because it's. Um, I mean, nowadays it's very important, but of course, I work on some other stuff. For example, I'll tell you now my schedule how it's more or less because before it, I was uh, concentrating on everything, but nowadays it's just impossible. That's why I'm trying to focus on the most important stuff. So mostly every day when I can, I'm trying to go to gym. For me, it's very important to to be in good shape. Actually, now after our interview, I'm going to play football because I really like it. Excellent. Uh, what I want to say is that sport for me is very important to doing sport because it's uh, you need energy and okay, we know that Carson is very good uh, in very good shape and many other top players. So. I mean, you really need to be in top shape to be a very good chess player. I mean, it's, I don't have doubt about this. I think it's uh, just very important. I mean, may, maybe nobody noticed this, but I think it's uh, maybe 50% because when you're very strong, you need to be in very good uh, physical shape. So I think it's very good. And this is uh, this I'm trying to do it every day. And uh, with chess, chess-wise, uh, I'm trying to, okay, openings, of course, but also to calculate. I'm trying to calculate every day, like two hours if I can. Even sometimes uh, I'm just at home with my girl and I just try to, you know, with my daughter. And uh, when she's playing, I'm just taking some positions and, you know, just calculating on my mind. So uh, on blindfold. Oh, good for you. So, so where... I mean, I'm just trying to all the time calculate a little bit every day because it's very important. And openings, okay, openings, it's the main stuff, but not only openings like, you know, just moves, but also understanding the positions that you reach and uh, understanding uh, how to to work on these positions, how to play these positions, you know. For example, I'm trying to, when I reach some, some let's say, on 20 moves, some small advantage, I try to, to see how to play later, you know, 
and uh, to understand more the position. So this is the the main goal for me. Uh, and uh, of course, what I say that sport is like I I really wanted the young players. If somebody is listening to me now. To, to understand that this is very, very important. So if you want to reach uh, top level, I mean, this is just impossible to do it without this. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, before, maybe nobody understood it, but l- lately everybody knows that this is the the most important stuff. And I think, actually, this is the main reason that Carson is so strong and always he's winning the last games. And, you yeah. Know, I mean, just... Also, Vesely, I just want to mention that when uh, 2005, when he, he was very strong, all the time he was starting very bad, but then lately he was winning all the games in the end of the tournament. So and he was very good in very good shape. I mean, he was going to gym all the time and running like 10 kilometers all the time, you know. And he was very good shape. So I think that's why he was very so strong. I mean, in the end of the tournament. So this is very it's very important. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. The top guys oh, are are so fit now. Um, yeah, but this is only the top guys because I I noticed that some young player maybe they don't pay attention uh, what to this but I mean they really need to do it because otherwise they will not be in the top I mean it's yeah very difficult. good yeah. yeah good advice um and, and in terms of working on your calculation uh w- what do you just pick positions from openings or how do you get the positions that you're working through no, I, uh, I just take some books for example studies or some book for calculations I mean there are so many lately that I mean you really just take some book but I try to do it on blindfold because yeah it's, uh, more productive for me. I mean, it's uh, interesting. And also sometimes um, when I analyze some position and then, for example, I go to, I don't know, somewhere to gym or something, I'm trying to think about this position. And many times, actually, I'm finding some very interesting ideas when I, you know, when I'm not in the chessboard, but when I'm just somewhere and I dig a little bit. And then when I check, it's very interesting idea. So sometimes you need to open up your mind, you know, and to give him some time and then you can find, for example, I remember that many times I I work on some positions like three hours, four hours, and then I couldn't find the exact way how to play, you know. I know that I'm very close, but, uh, you know, there's no exact way how to go. And then uh, I give myself some time, and after that, uh, okay, you find... Uh, uh, ideas always i mean it's like yeah there's there's been research about that outside of the uh, field of chess just about how like you often have bolts of inspiration in like the shower and stuff like no, that this is like the famous phrase of einstein i mean everybody knows it you know that uh, in the shower he's all the time have these ideas so i mean it's something similar that sometimes you need to you know open up your mind and then you just you find the way so in opening sometimes works because many times even with supercomputers sometimes they don't show immediately the you know, the most nasty way for, you know, to take the advantage of something. And sometimes you need to show him some move, you know, it's not so easy. And that's why you need to, you know, sometimes to open up your mind and then you to to okay. deliver the, the and final you, touch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and regarding the blindfold training that you do, um, is that something that you placed an emphasis on uh, um, as a developing young player? Or is like, uh, was that always a big part of your yeah, training? It's also very important. Yeah. I mean, I, I played blindfold t- when I was four years old. I mean, Whoa, wow. four old, yeah. Because <laughs> even my father, because he was, uh, I mean, he was my first coach and uh, he's a candidate of master. So he's has like 2100 or something like this. And he he teach me to play blindfold. So from that point, I was uh, playing all the time blindfold. Even he was winning some bets because nobody believed him <laughs> that I was playing blindfold when I was four years old. But okay, it, it's true. And um, later on, yeah, even with Veselin, many times I remember that we were just in, let's say, in sauna or in swimming pool, you know, and we just uh, lay down and then we we sort of have some ideas and try to to make it work and then always there were some interesting ideas that we were finding during our blindfold you know sessions so wow. i mean even okay you know maybe even chuk is also this kind of type he's all the time you know okay he's a bit strange of course but i mean he's all the time thinking about some positions you know <laughs> I mean, right it's like also i am very impressed of Gelfand, let's say because uh, all the time he's calculating during the game he's watching somewhere else you know <laughs> right and, yeah uh, Okay, I'm not this type of person, but I mean, uh, I think that it's really very useful to to be very good blindfold because you can imagine the position better, you know, and sometimes the pieces are um, disturbing you, so it's better to to calculate without piece because it's 
you can imagine the position much better than than when you see the position actually. So yeah, I, that's one of those things that only I feel like only twenty six and twenty seven hundred say it. I I find that hard to relate to. <laughs> uh, no, but this is uh, happening with a lot of training. I mean, okay, imagine I'm now thirty three years old and I was four. No, so like right. <laughs> like nine years, I'm like uh, all the time doing this and okay, and I'm even not in the top ten in the world. I mean, imagine the other guys. I mean, they're yeah. probably even much better so, so so i mean uh it's uh, you need to to work a lot in, uh, the ch- chess is very difficult i mean if you need to be in the top it's really very difficult you need to to be very um, it's like every sport i mean you need to or every profession i mean you need to be very focused and you need to do the best things uh, and what you what you can every day and maybe you hope to to succeed otherwise maybe you not but okay you have hope to succeed only if you you do all the best uh, you can. So yeah, and um, I mean, just just two more things. Um, so, any specific book recommendations or improvement advice you, you would give based on, okay. on from openings? You understand that I cannot give, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe in general, I like all these books of um, Chaba Bao. They were on the calculations. And uh, I also like the book of uh, Volkitin of Calculations, I write, like very much. It's already old book, I guess it's like five years already, I don't know, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, that's per- perfect. But chess, it's a very, think. very good book. Uh, yeah. And if you want to improve your calculations, I think this is very, very good book. Okay. And uh, yeah, Chaba Bauch, I like his books because they're every year they have the most interesting positions of the recent year. So it's... Uh, I mean, it's very good because the old books, I know all of them. So that's why I need to, you know. New, new positions. That's amazing. Yeah, that you just know them all. And, um, okay, now I I have some book that I need to to read. I didn't read, but I don't remember who wrote it. So I don't want to be ashamed to say. But it's about some, it's a, it was some Russian name. It's about some studies. So I need to really to, um, to check it because I heard uh, very good um, reviews from some grandmaster that is very Good book and probably for my level. So wow, okay. Uh, I will, yeah, I will need to check it because I don't remember now his name. And but it's just new book, just a very new book. So, um, but yeah. I think these books for calculations are yeah are very very good. Yeah, but okay. Bokitin I really recommend because it's a very nice book. Yeah, often often recommended by strong players like yourself. Um, and for for listeners who are lower rated, those are definitely higher level recommendations, but certainly the advice of working on your calculation and your blindfold play is something that any, anyone can take this to heart. book, I think, uh, that I mentioned this is for all levels. I guess it's also for uh, for weak players. So, I mean, it's... The, the, the Russian one or the Perfector Chess? No, the Chess? Volkitin, Volkitin okay. book, I think. Okay, cool. And yeah. l- last thing, Ivan, I mean, it seems, I mean... This has been really, uh, I've loved this interview, especially all the insights about Team Topalov is stuff that only a handful yeah. of people can can tell in the world, but it's great to hear about your career as well. Um, so are you en- are you enjoying yourself as a chess professional? Is is uh, is it a fruitful life for you? Yeah, of course. I enjoy very much. And okay, I'm uh, 33 years old now, but I still, maybe it would be like a joke, but I still think I can improve, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, of course. So I'm still improving, trying to improve. And um this is what I do. I mean, I really enjoy playing chess. I enjoy studying chess. So, and I enjoy winning at chess. <laughs> so, I mean, I really try to improve. And uh, this is this is what I'm doing here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and are you doing any? Are, mean, you, are you doing any training for players, or still uh, mo- focused on your own game and your books and helping uh, elite mostly players? Mostly on my play, but okay. Sometimes I have some lessons with some players, of course. But uh, mostly because I don't have a lot of time. I mean, I'm right. really traveling a lot and playing a lot. So, I mean, there's no time for everything. But okay, sometimes, of course, I can give some lessons to some people that I like, so I can give lessons okay but mostly yeah mostly even with the book now i mean i need to spend a lot of time also on the book so now it's becoming really difficult to do right. everything but uh, but i'm trying yeah i mean i'm not doing anything else i mean just i'm just doing sports uh, playing with my daughter and doing this so Sound, sounds <laughs> I mean, pretty good no to me things that i'm doing so yeah yeah that that sounds good to me and if there's anyone who would like to to keep up with your progress or to contact you is there is there a way for them to do that um yeah, okay, I'm uh, mostly on Facebook, I have accounts, so I mean, I'm sharing there a lot of stuff, so 
if somebody wants, always can check on internet or, uh, I mean, my tournaments, the tournaments I'm playing, they're very popular mostly, so everybody can just uh, Google and it's, uh, it's very easy, so. Okay. But my Facebook, everybody can check because it's, uh, it's easier, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, Ivan, I'll be rooting for you in Gibraltar. This thank, actually, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, this actually won't come out for ten days. So by the time it comes out, people can see how you're doing. So yeah, thanks. No, actually, it was a very good interview. Yeah, I'm really glad that you asked me. And uh, yeah, I hope maybe some other day we can do it even more. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to. Especially, you got to write that book. That book sounds amazing. Oh, one day I write, but I need. I think uh, first Vesely needs to retire because they're very interesting. Story. I cannot tell okay. now. I mean, okay, that makes sense. I can tell now, well, so. it seems like he might be on his way to retirement. So, so <laughs> yeah, maybe. okay, but I need to to hear from him that he retires officially. Then I will do it. Yeah. Awesome. But there's so, time. There's time. Yeah. yeah, something to look forward to. Okay. Well, good luck and thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, for making Perpetual Chess happen. I also want to thank all you guys and girls who helped me grow Perpetual Chess. That includes everyone who tells a friend about the show, everyone who writes a positive review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, whatever other podcast platform you may be on. All of it is appreciated and all of it keeps me going. But of course, most of all, I want to thank the people who provide financial support to the show. I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. They are Chessable Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jen Scream, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, John McCarthy, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oplin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Peter Sodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. And I would also like to thank the following people and entities. They are... Aaron Waffler, Ace Fayega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Day's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, the Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Moore, Jason Anfang, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Kapala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyovsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahalver, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwalder, WGM, Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Victor Vrinkouj, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, Zhivko Stoyanov, and that is everyone. Thanks, everyone. Catch you guys next week.